Good afternoon and welcome to Unbox Lunch. Before we get started, please know that this event is being recorded. I'm Jenny Williams, Associate Director for the Archives of American Art at the Smithsonian Institution. We're thrilled that you're joining us today. The Archives of, Americans are, of American Arts uh, Head of Collecting, Josh T. Franco, will soon join us and feature the newly acquired papers of Francis Colpit. A few housekeeping items. At any point during the webinar, you can submit your questions into the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Closed captioning is available. You can access this by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of the control panel. Now, I'd like to welcome and introduce Josh Franco. Hey, Josh. Hi, Jenny. Thank you for the intro. Um, these always fly by, so let's They do. Let's in. dig in. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, just a little bit of background before we jump into the boxes. Um, Francis Culpit's papers came to us, so the conversation started in February this year. Um, and it was one of those really sort of lovely instances where um, this is a bequeathal, so uh, Francis had made plans in her estate um, to make this offer for papers to the archives, which we were really thrilled to receive. Um, so we got an email from Jennifer Hope Davey, the artist and writer who I think is joining us, hello, um, on behalf of the estate and the family in February um, with this proposal. And bequeathals are handled by our registrar, actually. Um, so Susan Carey, uh, my colleague, handled the accessioning and intake process. So this really does have like the most surprise factor even for me of kind of unboxing. Um, I spent some time when they first arrived in the papers and I've spent some time this morning but um, we're kind of all in for this one together. So I'm excited to be doing this with you. Um, I think a lot of you out there know, but Francis Culpit professionally, most recently had a 17 year tenure at Texas Christian University. I know that that was um, really a special point of fact for our director, Ann Helmreich, um, who knew her there as Dean uh, at TCU herself in a past professional role. Um, so this just has a lot of special meaning for the archives. Also, I'm a Texan, so I'm really happy to have a Texan's papers. And um, Francis Culpit's work has been familiar to me as an art historian and Texan for a long time. Um, also, as someone who's done a lot of research in minimalism. So uh, I'll just note that her 1993 book, Minimal Art, The Critical Perspective, is a really important touch point in that field of study, as well as the number of monographs Culpit wrote uh, over her career. Um, Let's just dive in. So I have a kind of special thing to end on over here. I'm saying that so I don't forget, because again, these fly by. But I'm gonna grab this box here. And actually, it looks like let's begin with some things that are not paper, in fact, but um, audiovisual material. And feel free to chime in in the Q&A, in the chat. Um, I know a lot of you have a lot more context directly than I do, so please fill in any blank spots or add any um, sort of flavor you might think to. So um, maybe you didn't know, maybe you've thought about it or not, but our, the Archives of American Art does collect audiovisual material, born digital material. Um, it's always helpful when things are labeled. And this, I know you can read that. This says Chris Burden, documentation of selected work, 71 to 75. And that's typed out. And then in pen below that, it says McCarthy to Kelly, comma, Heidi. Um, so once this reaches our audiovisual lab, um, which is in the opposite corner of the office from where I'm sitting now, um, it will be, you know, we'll take care of it. It will be run through um, first of VHS to then eventually down the road, hopefully digitize it. Um, and we can see what's on this tape. So it's not something I would put in a VCR without the supervision of Mackenzie Beasley, my colleague in AV preservation. Um, so that's very interesting. I'm a big Chris Burden fan, as probably many of you are. Um, this is a really typical VHS format, but it looks like there's some other formats in here. Josh, we're already getting questions. As, as you had said, sure. we're, get, we're gonna get a lot of questions. Um, are there any of your teaching materials included? Oh yeah. Uh, Andrea is saying, I suspect a lot of us who are friends, students would be interested. I see that. Um, let me just, we'll jump, I have that uh, queued up next actually. Um, oh, and actually this is teaching material. So this is uh, a audio cassette, the label set. God, we love when things are labeled. It's incredibly helpful. Um, Dr. Francis Culpit dash luncheon lecture. Thursday, January 13th, 1983. 
an outsider's perspective on the permanent collection. That makes me curious which permanent collection. So probably that would be found out uh, when we get to play this again with supervision of the AV archivist, uh, play this cassette tape. And there's a number of cassette tapes in here, but I'll move on since we have a lot of material to look at. Uh, here, more teaching materials are in this box. I'm just gonna pull a folder out here, use my handy box divider so we can keep things in their original order. Uh, this says lectures concepts, uh, or lectures conceptual is the typed label. And just to give you some insight into the process. So right now, this is a deeded collection. It is accessible to researchers. So you could come to the reading room and look through Culpit's papers if you like, um, you know, starting today, tomorrow. Uh, but they will eventually, within a year or two, be further processed, um, which means all of these folders will be replaced with acid-free archival folders, but we will retain the labels. So the archivists who process this collection will make sure that we duplicate um, culprits, original intellectual ordering of things. Um, oh, this is great. So these are handwritten type or handwritten uh, lecture notes. Um, I see all kinds of names like Dan Graham, Ruscha, Hopper, Ferris 63, which I assume refers to Ferris Gallery. Um, if you wanna just get us, it's always really special to see someone's handwriting, I think, especially when they're no longer with us um, and to know they're preserved here. Uh, you can see phrases like performance on cameras. What is this? I'm curious about this audience comment. Performances on cameras and mirrors include audience as something of the work. Oh, as subject of the work. All right, so I'm already intrigued by that. Um, and just another note about the archives, this would be a great candidate actually. We work often with the Smithsonian Transcription Center, which is uh, a volunteer, uh, centralizes volunteers from all over the world virtually who take documents like this from Smithsonian's collections and transcribe them so that you can ultimately get, um, you know, typed versions that are keyword searchable and easier to read, although culpit has pretty legible handwriting anyway. So you wouldn't have the hardest time reading this. Um, I see things like condensation cubes. So maybe this is a Larry Bell situation. Um, yeah, so super interesting. All kinds of exhibitions and artists are referenced. And uh, as someone who also color codes their notes, <laughs> I love the culprit clearly did the same. So there's a red sort of subject heading and then the to the body of writing is in blue ink. Uh, which is super helpful. Josh, there's a note that the oh, I see that. Yeah. This, oh, look at all these notes. Uh, I'm not going to read all these out, but I will say everyone should open their chat. This is incredible. Um, but Jennifer Hope Davy does say the lecture on permanent collection from that cassette tape, I assume, was from the La Jolla Museum of Contemporary Art. That's amazing. Oh, and this collection did come with a very detailed inventory. Um, so thank you for working on that, uh, which is incredible. So this will really make the archivist's job. Um, quite easy. So I'm, I imagine a lot of what's there will be translated to our, um, our finding aid in the way we format it. I see Devin Nolan, Texan in Massachusetts. We never let go of our state identity, right? Um, and one of Fran's former students. Uh, yeah, we're happy to, to be doing this. Uh, oh, and Andrea Papa still has notes from her courses. It's amazing. Oh, I was looking at this earlier, and I kind of want to figure out what it is. Maybe some of you will have insight. And I didn't get a chance to do any Googling. It's this interesting, my big question is whether or not this is published elsewhere. But this it looks like a typescript of an essay by John Eden. Um, pretty formal. It has a dedication page. Uh, but it's, you know, it's not a printout of a published online or other lecture, it's definitely typed from a home computer. Um, so I would be interested to find out if this was published. The essay title is Light and Space, Copying the Masters. Um, just to read you a bit of the introduction, the following story is about a young outlier artist who grew up in the desert, an individual with a lifelong magnificent obsession and a Tennessee maker who migrated west after the Korean War. 
Um, and it's heavily illustrated, which is super interesting. So here's two illustrations of Tatlin and Doug Wheeler together. So I would like to know the connection between these two and I'm sure the essay um, illuminates that. Oh, like, and there's more students speaking up. Yeah, her influence is clear. Um, and we, I've heard that from a lot of folks and I know some folks who were her student uh, who've gone on to be curators, professors themselves, um, kind of all over, I think Culpit's influence is really all over the, the art world um, in this country for sure. Okay, I'm gonna switch us over to another box of teaching records. Oh yeah, so it was, you know, I know Copeland is kind of like 60s Ford scholarship, how I identify her myself. That's really because of my own interest, but I really think it's probably more fair to think of her as a scholar of the 20th century. Um, and I, that's being confirmed by this box here, which has a lot of Duchamp scholarship, um, which, you know, this is, I'm having that experience of uh, in my job uh, and all our jobs at the archives, we just, you know, we have to keep going um, to process and acquire collections uh, continually. And sometimes you just want to stop and be a grad student again and spend six months or a year just in one collection exploring and um, figuring out what you might contribute to its legacy or how you might pick it up and do different things with it. Um, so these are course materials in the most sort of direct sense. Here's a syllabus, the legacy of Marcel Duchamp. Oh, and Jennifer Hope Davy says the John Eden essay is not yet published. An artist himself, he and Fran were classmates and friends from USC. So that's great. And that's so such a valuable kind of component of the archives is unpublished manuscripts. We have tons. Um, they can be really exciting things to come across. So thanks, Jennifer, for shedding light on that. Uh, let me just read you some of the class lecture uh, titles from the syllabus. Um, my French is not, it's non-existent, but uh, on uh, November 26th, they <laughs> watched the video and track day 1924 by Rene Claire and Francis Picabia, um, starring Picabia, Eric Sadie, Man Ray, and Duchamp. The background lecture involved Corbet, Surratt, Picasso, and the founding of Dada. Uh, super interesting. And then the exhibition, uh, in Plain Sight Abstract Painting in Los Angeles um, was part of this. Oh, and this opened at Blue Star Art Space, which is in San Antonio. Um, I lived in San Antonio a couple of years and very familiar with Blue Star. And I'll say before uh, TCU, Culpit was also a professor at UT San Antonio. So there's a lot of San Antonio history in this collection as well. Um, so clearly it says no class and instead you were supposed to go to this opening, which is you know, a really fun way to fill a class spot. Okay, and I'm trying to stop myself from like forgetting everyone's there and just exploring things on my own. Uh, and then you have more handwritten notes. Let's see what else is in this folder. Uh, this is something also that's um, sort of our bread and butter at the archives, really small, slim, probably rare printed material. Um, often books, one rule of thumb for the archives, just FYI, is if it has an ISBN number, we typically do not collect it and uh, work with the Smithsonian Library or sometimes even the Library of Congress, which is just down the street. So researchers have access to that elsewhere. It's just a, a way of, um, you know, stewarding our storage and uh, being sort of resourceful. So this is a gallery guide to Duchamp's leg, an exhibition at the Walker Art Center in November 94 to March 95. The really great cover image there. Yeah, so it makes sense that this is in the Duchamp folder. Oh, Andrea, that's really nice. Uh, as a professor, my personal benchmark for student engagement was set by Fran when I was a grad student at USC, amazing. And that here's a color seminar folder. Let's see what that's all about. So there's some printouts of 
things. Oh, this is great. Uh, print out of chromophobia, which is a book that I really kind of changed my brain actually and how I think about color um, by David Batchelor. So clearly, yeah, of course that's in a color study course. And here's a course description again from another syllabus. Uh, this class will focus on the history, theory, and sensibility of color. Reading and discussion will consider philosophical, historical, and pedagogical theories, as well as optics and color theory. Polychrome sculpture and the relationship of color to music are other significant considerations. While color was rarely the focus of serious critical analysis from the 60s through the 90s, since the publication of David Batchelor's Chromophobia in 2000 and curator Ann Temkin's exhibition Color Chart at MoMA in 2008, it has emerged as one of the crucial issues of our time. Seminar will be discussion-based rather than lecture-oriented. And there again, with that reference to a really like a, you know, this class is in spring 2010 and it references a 2008 MoMA exhibition. Um, so clearly Fran was like always bringing in, sorry, I, I called her Fran because Andrea just did, I didn't know her. Um, Francis Culpit um, was uh, really thinking about what was happening at the moment and putting that in the context of, again, this longer 20th century history, which is a mark of a great professor, I think. Uh, so again, another class I wish I could just go back to school and take. You can see where there's students assigned different presentations um, written in. So on January 28th, there was a monographic presentation by Colleen, um, Lonnie Dix, and, and maybe on Richter. The last name Richter is here. Maybe that was a student. Maybe that's the painter um, who would be an interesting case color case to study for color. Um, we have grades, grade sheets, some Merleau-Ponty, and of course, um, some Donald Judd articles and printouts. Um, there are somewhere in here, I know photographs of um, trips to Marfa, Texas, Culpit took, or really trips to, sorry, the city in progress. Um, Michael Heiser's recently completed project out in the desert, um, but Culpit did a lot of Judd scholarship as well. Um, and specifically as a West Texan, I'm really interested in that work. Uh, so I think like we're seeing in the comments, there's like uh, so much evidence of her relationship with students, but she also was clearly, uh, you know, her scholarship was impacted by direct and friendly, warm, close relationships with artists themselves. So I, brought, I kind of did a, a little bit of hunting this morning. Let me put this way. Uh, because I did a search on our, just on our website, which you can do too, just her name. And she appeared in the finding aid for the David Navros papers. Uh, so that was a really interesting connection. And I, got that I have a little Navros box here we love I think this is the value of having papers at the Archives of American Art uh, the largest repository that covers this field as far as primary sources go so these connections are really sort of magical and everything starts to feel more complete and filled out when um, additions like this come in so from Colpitt's papers first uh, here in this oversized box uh, we have this book David Navro's fresco drawings. And typically this is something we would probably offer to the library. They are really, they have a beautiful art book collection at the Smithsonian Art Library. But in this case, we always check for this. Um, this is annotated, uh, dedicated especially to pulpit. So you see the inscription here, a special in quotes edition for Francis, uh, Love David 87. And I'll show you some of these drawings they are really incredible. So if you know Navros's work, um, his fresco murals are, are sort of um, shaped canvas paintings. Uh, they really do a lot of like, here's the a kind of general out rectilinear shape, but then inside these very sophisticated, intricate plays of angles and colors. Um, 
and it's all the murals I've seen are very much 90 degree angles so it's interesting to see round shapes actually in this particular drawing so drawings are clearly a space of experimentation there's another one So this book's an amazing object, uh, but then, so like I said, I went to Navarro's papers to see, um, you know, what that, what the listing was all about. And there are letters. And I don't need the box marker here because the Navarro's papers have been fully processed, which means all the folders are uh, numbered. So I can put it back in order without uh, the marker. So this is David Navarro's correspondence, Francis Colpich. And this is a typed letter. And I'll read a few lines. Dear David, thank you so much for the beautiful drawings. I'm anxious to get them framed and up so I can look at them. So clearly they were trading uh, works or David was sending her works often uh, or at least more than once. Let me know what project they're for. I don't think I recognize the imagery. Uh, oh, so they were probably preparatory drawings for a painting or a mural. I'm enclosing my review of Meyer's book. You won't, you probably won't agree with my take on it, especially the anthology section, which I found interesting and less controversial than you. Uh, I'm now rereading and doing a final cleanup on my essay for abstract painting book, newly retitled Abstract Art in the Late 20th Century by Cambridge U Press. In the section on your show at Rice, I cite and dismiss Nodelman's description of your rooms as environmental sculptures, and in parentheses, I'd forgotten this. Um, so interesting. And then this just, I love this. This is where the archives make people really human, and you get a sense of their personalities and, um, you know, who they were as people. I haven't seen any really good art in ages. I like Alan, Rupp Alan Ruppersberg's show at ArtPace a lot, ArtPace being another great San Antonio institution. It's a handsome conceptual installation, funny and smart. I was taking a friend around SA last night, last weekend, and realized that all of the shows up now, uh, of all of the shows up now, there is no painting whatsoever. It's just so passe. Haven't been in Houston since the summer and have no desire to see the Twombly sculpture show. I did see the Rothko Chapel when I was last there. The paintings look fabulous. The walls are now cool gray and the whole place feels very, very different. And that's very interesting because now, you know, it's 2023, the Rothko Chapel is really um, established as a as installation, as a piece of architecture, as a group of paintings. Um, but to kind of get this perspective from an expert when I guess it was still in development, this is October 20th, 2000, or at least went through a moment of significant formal changes. Pretty fascinating for me. And then I'll read this last bit. I've been thinking a lot about your idea countering my argument that contemporary painting is the result of conceptual art, that surrealism is to blame. In his piece on Wesley in this month's art forum, Dave Hickey says that 90% of contemporary art is dependent on surrealism. Of course, he likes it. I like Wesley, but I don't like surrealism in general. And then did I tell you I wrote a piece on Judd for a magazine newspaper in Madrid? I'm anxious to see it. It's on one piece, the four part galvanized iron box piece with the blue tube now at the Norton Simon and, and, and original shown in primary structures. <laughs> I'm glad we weren't in Marfa, the weather was horrible. Uh, love to you and Joanna and Jason. And then it is signed to, by hand in Fran, uh, Fran and Penn. So, and then the rest of this folder is that review she wrote of James Meyer's uh, minimalism book, which again is another you know touch point um, and studies of minimalism, certainly on my shelves and marked up heavily. Uh, and, yeah, these fly. We have six minutes left. Are there any um, questions or further comments from folks? And I'll um, maybe grab another box while you think. Well, Josh, while people are typing in their comments and questions, just wanted to take a moment to recognize several members of um, her family that have joined us today. So thank you all for for attending. Oh, we have a, actually a comment yeah. from it looks like a cousin. <laughs> it's just thanking us for highlighting her work. I used to see right. Fran at the Culpit family reunions in Oklahoma during their 80s and 90s. 
Thanks, Ben. We're really honored to, to do it. Oh, here's another good example of a different kind of archival material, slides. So many slides. And we can look at some visual material here. These are also always great things. Again, these slim, you know, exhibition announcements. They're just really good for hard facts, like dates and times um, that things took place. I'll say this, what this gallery put the year on their show, which not all galleries do. So if you run a gallery or ever do this kind of publicity, put the year, because a researcher in 10 years, 50 years uh, will be really grateful. I can't tell you how many researchers get frustrated when the year is not on the exhibition advertisement. Josh, we have a question. Um, sorry to interrupt. Have you come across any notes about her curatorial practice or exhibit planning? Um, they are in here, and I don't know like immediately which box they're in. But since you say that, this might have you know this might have been part of that research. It looks like it's probably a digital photograph that she printed out. Um, it's the bottom, it says installation photo of painting number one through six from the Pascal's Water Wager, Water Series at USC. Maybe somebody out there knows if, um, what this is referring to. This is, these are not familiar to me. But it is a pretty comprehensive collection that covers a teaching, publishing and exhibition. So I imagine that material is there. Um, I love this, but I'm kind of a sucker for a monochrome. So uh, all 10 paintings from the Athens Jerusalem series. Um, and there were so slides, but I didn't show them. Here you go. No. What was that, Jenny? Sorry, is there a material that went into her dissertation included? I know she talked about uh, Greenberg oh, a number of times. That's a good question. So I know there's exhibition stuff. I don't want to say for sure if there is that. It's likely, um, but again, I haven't gone through this uh, in detail on my own. So it's a good opportunity to invite you all to come research um, her papers in our reading room. Let me put this back. Deborah says USC. Are there materials from USC? Yes. I'm not sure what the question is. Oh, okay, so this folder, I didn't say it because I didn't know what it meant. It says H-E-N slides, and I did not think it referred to an actual hen, but the folder preceding it says hard edge now. Um, so I'm, you know, I think it's probably safe to assume that's what that stands for. And that is a good lesson in why we keep things in order um, that the creator left, made them because those kinds of connections can be made. So if any, I guess that's an exhibition. I don't know if that's her exhibition or another, but Hard Edge Now USC. If anyone has any light to um, shed on that, please let us know. There's a lot of, oh, here's printed out emails. It says Wheeler, I assume that's Doug Wheeler. Oh, Jennifer. Yeah, Jennifer did the inventory. Thank you. Her original bound dissertation is included, as well as audio interviews with artists and Clement Greenberg. Yeah, the, where I showed you those cassette tapes earlier, there was quite there's a, quite a few of them. So that's probably where those cassette those interviews are. Uh, yeah, and these are printed out emails from Doug Wheeler. We do collect emails as born digital content. FYI, folks out there. Yeah, one last minute. I don't know if anyone has anything else to add or questions to ask, but please come visit the papers. We're really, really thrilled to be their home. And they um, will go back immediately to much safer storage than my office, although my office is fine. But, you know, we got the good storage here. Yeah. Josh, do you want to answer this one last question? How do you preserve the AP sure. AP material and talk about it digitization? Yeah, so... Um, we have, you know, audiovisual archivists team here on site. They have a lab where they can process most formats. Uh, right now, we're doing an inventory of uh, all audiovisual material, and then from there, um, digitization is, is not an automatic thing. If 
it can happen a lot of ways. We have a digitization on demand program where researchers can request it. Um, you do have to wait till there's a finding aid produced to access that. Um, or if things you know are decaying, although everything here is in really good shape, so that kind of urgency is not a factor. Um, we might digitize in that case. But um, yeah, but we have the capacity to, to do that for sure. So just write us if you're interested in finding out more. Okay, well, thank you, Josh. And thank you everyone for joining us today um, for our Unbox Lunch. And we hope that you'll uh, join us for another program um, in the future. Take care, have a great day. Bye.